just in time for a new century. Most Burton films are meta, in my opinion. Meta contextual, meta whatever. That word seems to be thrown around a lot lately, and um, it's kind of lost its artful qualities. Sleepy Hollow is a reimagining. A lot of Burton films are reimaginings, only Burton shows that we remember cinematically, that memories are filmic reimaginings. Of course, Sleepy Hollow is a reimagining of a Washington Irving tale um, written by uh, Andrew Kevin Walker, who wrote, who wrote the script, who also wrote a 7 8 millimeter, it's, and the game, I think. So it's really interesting um, seeing this Andrew Kevin Walker screenplay go through the uh, Tim Burton kaleidoscopic blender. But yes, uh, memories are filmic reimaginings, and ghosts are life's filmic shadows. They are impressions of what was. All films are dead things. Static, in a way. But murder needs no ghost to come from the grave, but cinematic murder always requires one. In Sleepy Hollow, Crane's memories operate as film within film, as exemplified by, uh, by his childhood toy. Becomes unrealism on top of unrealism. The one with the cardinal on one side, uh, the other a cage about optics. Separate pictures that become one in the spinning. It is truth, but truth is not always appearance. This speaks to Tim Burton's understanding of truth, understanding of memory. And the only thing that is truthful about our memories are the cinematic ways that we remember them. And of course, uh, his leads, Johnny Depp and Christina Ricci, are uh, unearthly attractive here. They are both so appealing to the eyes in this film that it's maddening. But Sleepy Hollow presents a gateway between two worlds, uh, with the Tree of the Dead, from which the Headless Horseman emerges as if birthed, giving birth to a memory. Uh, memories are the only things that make us cognizant, that make us uh, truly and actually... Um, Creatively alive, uh, creativity means a lot to Tim Burton. And this is the, <clears throat> every time a new memory is birthed, it is, uh, it is changed. It, it is changed re uh, cinematically, and every time you remember something, remembering anything uh, creates unrealism, um, creates a reimagining. And it's not to say this is all completely fantastical. There is actual true horror filmmaking in the slaughter of the entire Killian family, and also in the Iron Maiden fantasy or uh, memory that, that Ichabod himself has. And A Sleepy Hollow is a film that, um, that gives us uh, heads that wear dark masks of righteousness, right? Uh, Sleepy Hollow speaks of kisses and melodrama in gothic comic self-aware shades, and it's a genuinely funny film. This film did have me laughing quite a few times, it takes place in a fantasy village lost to mysticism and magic, lost to cinema. Tim Burton and Suicide Blondes is something that we should probably dive into as well. Tim Burton is obsessed with, uh, with blondes. He's completely preoccupied with them. It makes you um, think of uh, Hitchcock and Hitchcock's famous preoccupation with Suicide Blondes as well. So here we have Christina Ricci, but of course, like, just to name a few, I mean, in Edward Scissorhands, we had Winona Ryder dyed blonde, and of course you'd have Anne Hathaway dyed blonde later for his Alice in Wonderland films. He is very interested in uh, gaunt, busty blondes and terrorizing them on film. And uh, nearly virginal, um, uh, nearly childlike as well. I think Christina Ricci was only 18 years old during the making of this film, and Tim Burton seems to revel and terrorizing her. In fact, uh, Tim Burton in this film um, it seems to be a filmmaker possessed. Um, possessed by the motifs of the fairy tale. Possessed by every wonderful um, quality that goes into fairy tale filmmaking. We have the wicked stepmother motif in this film. Um, it, it carries over from his other films like Beetlejuice, uh, j j j just to name one. I mean, uh, the, Every Tim Burton film ha has all of these uh, fantastical qualities, you know, the Dark Avengers, swords, beheadings, um, and then we get these amazingly metacontextual moments where the, the film is self-aware of, of its own um, 
superfluousness, right? The servant girl Sarah, seemingly extraneous and entirely forgettable to a point, uh, there are quotes of, I always thought she was useless, which she had been in the film's mind, but it seems she had a purpose after all. And Tim Burton makes all of these um, kind of wild meta statements with a, sat with a satanic glee. Um, as is common, Burton's absurdist view of death is not fixed or inert, it is entirely transformative. And there are Kafka-esque absurdities in this universe as well. Um, Christopher Walken is incredible at the Headless Horseman on his rampage, and famously his first screen kiss is an unforgettable moment. Um, with these white witches and wicked compendiums, this is a film that is bewitched by reason or beaten down by it, or perhaps both simultaneously. And of course the film came out in 1999, um, famously the last lines of this film, just in time for a new century. So what does Tim Burton, how did he view the new century? How did he view um, the artistry of the new, se of the, of the new century? I, I, I believe he viewed the new millennium as a time where uh, the lines between art and uh, actuality will become even more blurred even more blurred, because we have these memories of film, and if memories are themselves cinematic, and filmmaking is just a, a, so such a powerful thing, uh, films are such a powerful thing to watch because they are built on, uh, on, on top of that inherent unrealism within our memory, and they're able to kind of uh, project that. They're able to capture the unrealism of memory itself, and we have memories of film, and we even learn our ethos. Um, we feel pathos. We feel sympathy. We learn a lot of morality from film. So we are learning cinematically, and we are acting more cinematic as well, it, it, or, it, or more artful. Um, I think that we are becoming a kind of impressions of impressions, creations of creations, not necessarily derivative, not necessarily negative. Um, it could be a form of enlightenment, but there are restrictions to this um, enlightenment because it is all reimagining, but the reimagining is inescapable if you are a living creature kind of building memories where there weren't any to begin with. Uh, Sleepy Hollow, this is the first time I've watched this in a very long time. I possibly haven't watched this film in almost 20 years. And I, I thought it was really incredible. I had slightly low expectations going into it. I thought it was kind of a throwaway Burton film, but no, I think that it is absolutely fantastic. It's an absolutely fantastic film. And um, <coughs> apologies for that cough, but I feel it's on the higher uh, tier for, for Tim Burton. I feel like this is where he really gets that, that, um, that, that, that the, the power of... Um, statements about art within art. I think this is really where that power um, is harnessed fully. And so um, in, in Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street, much, much later on, he can really capitalize on the premise of art commentating on art and um, in essence, or in, as in a reimagining of doing that, uh, it comments directly about um, the human condition. So Sweeney Todd the Demon Barber of Fleet Street, I feel, is the finalized version of a lot of the um, kind of artistic um, language that is in Sleepy Hollow. Uh, it, it brings th th that kind of um, really possessed and possessive cinematic language uh, directly to the forefront. And I, I feel that everything about Sleepy Hollow is, is incredibly entertaining and also extremely powerful. I think Tim Burton is extremely powerful when he is um, focusing on the creative spirit and uh, the role of the human condition within the creative spirit, because all human beings become creative when we recall, when we recall a memory, because we have to recall it in an unreal way, in a way that we know is cinematic, in a way that we know is um, different, absolutely different. There is nothing um, kind of less trustworthy than human memory. But there's also nothing less powerful. There is, uh, we, all we are is, is a combination of the different memories that we believe that we have, that we reimagine. And you can reimagine yourself to be uh, a bunch of different people all at the same time, all of your different selves. We become optics. Once again, we become bewitched by reason or beaten down by it, but I think it's both simultaneously. And I, I, I think Sleepy Hollow is a... Uh, 
is a wonderful film. It's not just an exercise. It's a perfectly completed film, full of style, full of that German expressionist style, full of the old monster movie style. But of course, monster movies are arguably like the James Whale ones and uh, uh, Todd Browning. Those monster films are in part derivative of German expressionist films of Robert Vine and Fritz Long, you know, Hands of Orlock, Caligari, uh, Metropolis. They're derivative of that style. But this is a reimagining of the style, and the style takes on new form, new characteristics, a, a new mood when it's reimagined, because it's a filmic memory. It's unrealism on top of unrealism, on top of statements about artistic and creative unrealism. Memories force us all to become artists or creatives in some sort of capacity. And Sleepy Hollow is a film that really, really understands that and really understands how to express that in a way that is um, not intrusive, in a way that is uh, deliberately composed, in a way that is um, refined and uh, clear. There's a great amount of clarity with Sleepy Hollow. And I want to thank you guys for watching this video. Um, Sleepy Hollow is, is a wonderfully uh, fantastical film. And uh, yes, I am in love with Christina Ricci and Johnny Depp in this film. They are incredible to look at. They uh, have an incredible amount of chemistry. And Tim Burton knows, of course he knows how to film Johnny Depp. That's his eternal muse. And he films him splendidly in this film, and Christina Ricci ha possibly has never looked better. Uh, this is a, an absolutely fantastic film, even if we're looking at it from the base superficial notions. Um, but I really don't think there's anything superficial about the film's messaging. The film's messaging is about unrealism and how it is built on top of unrealism. And how unrealism is something tactile, something that you could actually feel. Just because something is unreal doesn't mean that it's untruthful. And once you can, uh, once you get to the bottom of that statement right there, you really understand Tim Burton's methodology. Just because something is unreal does not mean it is untruthful. Because there is a uh, there, there, there is a great distinction, a great delineation between the two. It's not a dichotomy. It's a relationship of command, a relationship of control, a relationship of creativity. And the value, the value of creativity, there's an enormous amount of value in Tim Burton's work. The cardinal itself um, is a fascinating metaphor. There's a lot of metaphorical value. There's a lot of value in this language that Burton, uh, Burton uses, Burton utilizes extremely well. The cardinal, um, as a bird, is seen several times in this film, um, either literally or um, kind of an impression of it on uh, on, on Ichabod's uh, optical illusion childhood uh, trinket, his toy. And, of course, this could mean, you know, a cardinal is appointed by the, the, the Pope, and that this film also has some things to say um, in favor of mysticism, um, in opposition to, uh, to Catholicism, of course. But I think that... Um, what is truly spiritual for Tim Burton is actually the cinema itself. So I think that this this cardinal metaphor is is truly symbolic of of memories, of filmmaking, of unrealism. And I think that seeing it both as a literalized bird and um, painted onto Ichabod's toy and and used to um, really express illusion, to express unrealism is how something can be both unreal and truthful at the same exact time. There's a lot of value in this film, and I think that Tim Burton needs to be reappraised, because I think he's the definition of the American auteur in Manifest. He's the definition of that. He's an extremely important filmmaker, and it's time he's, he, he, he got his intellectual due. It's time that that we really stood back and studied his work. Because films like Sleepy Hollow are fascinating. And just in time for a new millennium.